playing shows anywhere and everywhere to audiences of young and old Harry Potter fans. Their work inspired hundreds of others to start a band, get a MySpace, plan and book shows, and much, much more. Some of them are still at it. Some of them aren't. Some of them said they retired in 2009 and are actually sitting here with us today. If you interview any musician or just get talking with them, you're bound to hear stories from the road. The communal, often do-it-yourself aspects of touring on the cheap is a guaranteed recipe for shenanigans of all varieties. So without further ado, let's see what we can get them to share. So I'm, the way this is going to work is I'm going to ask them questions to get them to tell you stories, just because I can't be like, well, tell me stories, guys. I want to hear all your stories. We need to like, prompt them a little bit. So the first question, which is open to anybody, the first person to respond, just go nuts. Favorite venue you've ever played in rather than city? Because you never get a straight answer out of these guys when you ask for your favorite city. Orlando Library. <laughs> is, that, is that a librarian? Over there? Yeah. Hi, nice to see you again. Thank you for having us. <laughs> um, I, well, I, I'll, I'll leave. Or does anybody else want to take me? Um, when the sixth Harry Potter book came out, uh, Joe and I uh, were like, let's do something special. Not, not book, sorry, the movie. It was a movie. As when the sixth Harry Potter movie came out. Let's do something special. And we're like, let's play in a cave. And uh, we couldn't find a good cave. <laughs> Uh, but we were able to find a chasm uh, that was located in a, a, like a state park in central Massachusetts. So we invited everybody to the chasm. And we're like, hey, we're going to play in this chasm. It'll be at like 8 o'clock. Then afterwards, we're all going to go to this movie theater and watch the movie. Um, so we, we had no idea what would happen. We're just like, well, maybe some people will show up and play for them. And uh, it turned out like people really got into that idea. And I think we had maybe like 70 or 80 maybe even 100 people come down and we kind of hiked, it was a short like three or four minute hike down into this chasm and we just set up and played just acoustic, really simple, clock and spiel, acoustic guitar, no microphones. Yeah, it was like, it was the first time we did a set like that too. So yeah. We didn't know what was gonna happen. <laughs> Would it yeah, be it cheating out. if I said leaky con? <laughs> That's a valid answer, I'll allow that. Yeah, I just, I, like, I've, I've played it every single one, and I just, it, I, I already know to expect the best show possible, but I am always still somehow surprised at how, like, excited everybody is, and it's wonderful to be here, and I'm, yeah, for sure, like, you Cool, 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 okay. The next weirdest slash most alternative venue ever played, and Paul and Joe are exempt from this question because they would win otherwise. So, I'll tweet an answer later. <laughs> I, I was going to just say really quick, adding on to Lauren's answer, was that in recent memory, um, the venue for LeakyCon London was um, like perfectly sized for the amount of attendees in, in the audience, and it was a really, really magical show. It was just, it was incredible. You may proceed. <laughs> now get to the weird stuff. Let's yeah, let's let's get it weird. Anybody? When Anybody the Mudbloods very first started, like before I met any of these people, um, I, we probably chatted online or something. But we got asked to play. We were in Austin, and we got asked to play a Sweet Sixteen party <laughs> in Temple, which is like an hour north, a really small town at the VFW, and uh, it was like us. There's like four of us in the band and like 12 kids at the birthday party. <laughs> and they were all awkward teenagers. As everyone tends to be at that age, 16, and they all just like stood in the very back of like the VFW hall. And we were on the stage at the completely other end of the VFW hall. <laughs> And she asked us to play like this really sad Sufjan Stevens song. And that was her request. And yeah, it, was, it, was, it was real weird. <laughs> What'd you get paid? It paid really well. Uh, <laughs> I got a private concert from Lauren in the bathroom yesterday. <laughs> Whoa. That's some serious Morning Myrtle stuff. <laughs> 
she told me the exact same thing and she came to the store. Uh, one of the very first shows we played as well was a, uh, I think it was maybe like a seventh or eighth show, we played at a hot dog jamboree. <laughs> I don't even remember who put on the hot dog? Do you remember anything about this? I don't even think the hot dogs were that good. <laughs> they weren't that good. That was that was maybe the bigger letdown, not the fact that like we were terrible. And we were we, real excited to play. Hot we were so <laughs> excited to play the hot dog jamboree, but the hot dogs were bad, and it didn't even have like a jamboree feel. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, what, on the, oh, sorry, not Brad. He's, He's so sorry. sorry. I thought I was a good compliment to your drums in Grenadine Forge's set, but I guess you didn't like my bass playing. Uh, I loved it. Um, okay, uh, I just wanted to quickly add, on the first Want the House tour in 2008, we booked two months of house parties across the U.S., and um, one of them was in Montana, and we didn't have much of a fan base in Montana. Um, so it was Justin and... Um, Catch Love and I, and we played for uh, one person um, in her basement uh, while, while her parents were upstairs cooking us dinner. <laughs> and, and that's what we did. We, we played the show and then we went up and had dinner with her family. <laughs> that is amazing. I'm so glad you shared. Actually, Catch Love actually made money that night on merch, too. <laughs> <laughs> totally amazing. Yeah, I, I think that's a real story here. That, that is amazing. Okay. What's the craziest, not necessarily the largest audience that you've ever played to? It's WikiCon. Across the board. I'll just, Any particular WikiCon or just in general? You guys would be Harvard Square, right? Oh. Maybe. That, that was the most massive, but not exactly the craziest. Well, yeah, so when the 7th Harry Potter book came out, we played at, uh, on the Harvard campus. And it was kind of, it turned out to be like the place to be in all of New England. So there was like 10,000 Harry Potter fans. Uh, it, was, it was pretty good. Um, yeah, I don't know if they were like... Super excited to see us, but they're definitely excited about something that night. <laughs> um, Can't imagine what. <laughs> yeah, so that crowd was pretty cool, but I think WikiCon still uh, beats it, seriously. Yes. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I'll, I'll take it. The most surreal on stage experience you've ever had. So this could go in a number of directions. Uh, surreal. That time Evie Lynch came up and danced during I Believe in Nargles. Yeah. Good answer. Also, I think you come. Paul told this story uh, yesterday, but he hit me in the face with his guitar <laughs> and I was bleeding <laughs> from my tooth hole. <laughs> Yeah, I had ice in my mouth, it's good. <laughs> Joe, it was during the first song of our set, and Joe was a real trooper, he managed to keep, keep playing the entire show while bleeding from his face <laughs> and mouth. And then in the morning, we had to take him to the dentist to straighten out his tooth. Uh, roll tape. <laughs> we have that film. Oh, you guys didn't get my AV request, sorry. <laughs> Matt, you're... It, the first Whopping Willow show, didn't you just kind of like sway to a Kansas song or something? <laughs> that might have been a more surreal experience for everyone else. Um, not necessarily for those on stage. Um, I, I knew what was going to happen. And I, was, I was really dedicated to it. <laughs> um, that was, I, I think that's still one of the best Whopping Willow shows of all time. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Okay. 